when you're in a life-threatening situation, uh, the last thing you want to do is freeze up or, or freak out. Uh, there was a young lady in my last church. Um, she was very quiet, a total introvert. Uh, in the years she came to the church, I only had a few conversations with her because they were always really short and to the point. Uh, and uh, she's very sweet. Uh, and uh, she missed church for, I don't know, five, six weeks, and I, you know, I didn't know where she was. And so when she finally came back to church, uh, since it was a lot smaller church, I only had about, I don't know, 200 people, I could tell who was in church on a given Sunday, who missed, et cetera. It was t- now I have no idea. Um, but uh, so I said, you know, wh- where have you been? And she said, well, I had a little accident. I went, oh, that's, that's too bad. And like, like, what happened to you? So she said, well, I, I had a car accident. So well, like, well, explain. So where, where I lived in Northern California in Stockton, uh, Stockton is the most, uh, it, it's the, it has a seaport in the middle of town, so it's the farthest inland port of any city in the United States. So uh, there's a channel that goes all the way out to San Francisco to the ocean. Uh, so there's huge uh, ships downtown. Uh, and then there's 2,000 miles of waterway all around the city. So I fished those for 20 years with all my friends. Their boat's not mine. Never buy your own boat. I learned that as a boat salesman better to have friends with boats. And so I have fished all over those 2,000 miles of waterways. So having said that, her little story relates to the waterways. So the water could be 30 feet deep, 60 feet deep, running. It's a current. Uh, Been there many times, a lot of debris in the water. Um, So I I am not a dark water person. I will fish in the water. I will go deep sea fishing in heavy seas. Done it many times out of San Francisco, Bodega Bay. Just don't put me in it. I don't like to be in it because you can't see what's in there, right? Not cool. Uh, and so this l- lovely young lady uh, told me that she was driving her car along a levee, like we all did, uh, and there's no guardrail basically on the levees, and she had a blowout on the passenger side on the front facing the levee. Well, you know physics? Took her little car and threw it off the road into the levee, 50 miles an hour, just ejected her car, just like a missile. And so she said, I was flying through the air, and <laughs> could you imagine? She said, as I'm flying through the air, the car begins to roll upside down. That's even worse. Bam, hits the water. Uh, and uh, she said, it kind of jarred me, you know, as I hit the water. She said, I'm hanging in my car upside down. And all of a sudden, water starts coming in, you know, little places, you know, slowly. And she said, uh, what am I going to do? So she says, gets out of the seat belt, you know, uh, and, and tries to get out, but you can't because of the pressure of the water because the car is sinking. Uh, and I'm thinking, I would have totally freaked out at that moment. I mean, I would have had a heart attack. Uh, but what did she do? Well, she said, uh, as the car began to take on more and more water, it's like half full of water and it's going down. She said, I'm watching the light up above me start to go away and be replaced by total darkness. It's broad daylight. And she said, as it's getting darker, 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 and the water's getting higher and higher. She said, I realized what I had to do. I had to focus on my plan was to wait till the car filled with water, take my last breath, then I could either get a door open or roll a window down. Would you have freaked out? How many would have freaked out? Be honest. Yeah, I'm with you. Total chicken. I th- think I would have totally freaked. Uh, so she said, I waited until the car filled up with water. I took my last breath in the darkness, uh, and I then was able to roll a window out and swim 30 feet to safety. <laughs> she should be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> I'm just saying. Isn't that what those guys do for like a living? I mean, and you had to see her to really appreciate it. I'm like, really? Frail you? I mean, amazing, the tenacity. So if you're in a situation that is a life-threatening situation, what is the worst thing you can possibly do? Freak out. Freeze up. She did not. She had faith in what she knew she needed to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I heard her story. I'm like, that could preach all day long. (laughs) Right? Don't you listen to life like this? Like, what's this got to do with life? I've told you this for, I don't know, how long I've been here, 12 years? Everything has everything. Just pay attention. So think about David. David had a blowout moment. So David's blowout moment, and a blowout is when you, something you didn't expect happens to you and hurdles you in a direction you never wanted to go. And it's a worst case scenario, and you're thinking, why did this happen? So David's blowout moment was King Saul hates him, is jealous of him. So he wants to remove him. He's his political competition. So he wants to get rid of David, so he hunts David to take him out. But David is their, is their major military hero because he took out Goliath. So the people love David, and they don't really like Saul as much as they like David. So Saul is trying to take him out. So as we said a couple Sundays ago, David gets some intel from Doeg. Remember Doeg, the troublemaker? He gets info, intel from Doeg where David's whereabouts are. So he's sending teams out to take him out. 
In the meantime, David realizes my blowout situation with the king coming after me, I gotta get somewhere where he'll never find me. He, he travels to Philistia, to the Philistines, his enemy, and he goes to one of their main cities, Goth. He hides out there. This is all the background for Psalm 56, by the way, in case you're wondering. I do, I do not meander, do I? I don't. Psalm 56, background of this. 1 Samuel chapter 21 tells you what happens when he got to the gate of the city. Now, if you sit there and you tell me, I just don't read the Bible. I've tried it a few times, but it's so boring. Really? You need to keep reading, my friend. 1 Samuel 21, he gets to the gate of the city. What happened? So he changed his behavior before him, the guards of the gate. He feigned madness in their hands, and he scratched on the doors of the gate, and he let his saliva fall down on his beard. Whoa! Whoa! Now, just imagine if you are, if you are uh, one of the guards at the gate and you see this crazy Jewish guy coming from you know, Israel and he's at the gate of your city and he's scratching on the gate like trying to claw his way in and you see him and it's like somebody's got to say, hey, that, that guy looks like David. Yeah, I know, I think it is David. It is David. Man, he's, he's crazy. Drooling all over himself. I mean, wasn't he the guy that took out Philistia? The, the, the you know, Goliath? What, yeah, mm-hmm. what happened to him? He's lost his mind. So that extra stuff that's not in the Bible added. Verse 14 says, Then Achish, the king, they obviously led him in the gate, and they brought him to the king. So they brought him to Achish, and he says to his servants, as he's looking at David, uh, Look, you see this man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Translated, he has no right to stand in my presence as the king of Philistia. Get, get him out of here. He's crazy. Now you have to stop, as I did, and ask yourself, he's their enemy and the one who took out Goliath. Why didn't they kill him? Do you want to know? You got to come back at 6 o'clock tonight. I'll tell, I'll tell you. No. <laughs> No, uh, because they believed in their culture uh, that uh, demonic spirit, uh, spirits inhabited crazy people. So if you attacked the crazy person, you ipso facto attacked the demons. Who would want to do that? So they let him go. So David is turned loose in what city? Gath. Uh, walking around, living there, hiding out from Saul because this is the last place Saul would ever look for him. Again, let's go back to your life. You had a blowout. Your life is thrown in a situation that you never thought you would be in before. You're in, your car hit the water. You're upside down. You're taking on water. You're going down to the abyss of Gath, and you're thinking, what in the world? Why would God send him here? This is so inappropriate, etc." David says, uh, hey, I've been in a situation like that, and let me tell you what I learned. And that's Psalm 56. Remember I told you I don't wonder. We wondered right to Psalm 56. What does he tell us here? Well, he's going to tell you how to have confidence when you face hostile situations. Hostile situations. Notice verse 1, which is verse 1 in the Hebrew text. It's a superscription in your English Bible. But it says, to the chief musician, this thing is set to uh, the title of the psalm, uh, the, the silent dove in distant lands, which was David. It's a miktam of David, denoting like what kind of instrument it should be played on, etc. When the Philistines captured him in Gath. So David pictures himself here, not, he's a warrior. He's been in battle many times, but he pictures himself here, not as a hawk, but as a dove. So when you think, that's kind of odd, isn't it? When you think of a dove, what words come to mind? Peaceful, kind, cuddly. I'll try to catch one, it's not simple. Uh, cuddly, uh, they coo, have you heard them? Yeah, they're really, really pretty uh, and um, innocent, right? So he says, let me, let me tell you, my image, my metaphor for me while I was in Goth was, I was a godly man in a godless environment. It, it, it was like I was a dove surrounded by vultures. How do you live when you're in a hostile environment? So that's what he's going to tell you in, in chapter 56 of the Psalms. He's going to give us three concepts to think about. But before we look at those three concepts of how to live confidently in a, in a hostile environment, I want to tell you about the rhetorical structure of the passage because it's kind of an emotional passage. Um, verses 1 to 3 and verses 5 to 9 uh, contain the majority of the discussion of the passage where he talks about what they did to him while he lived there, how they opposed him as a Jew in their environment, as a godly man in their environment, how the Philistines came after him. Verses 1 to 3, 5 to 9. So we're going to principal up, principalize those ver verses in our first point to talk about what they mean to us today. Then verse 4 and verse 10 and 11, at the end of those sections, are a refrain 
uh, where he gives you insight and in, uh, further insight into how to live in a situation like that, a positive refrain. And then the, the final verses, 12 to 13, is the climax of the passage. It's the crescendo if you play the piano. It's the end. Uh, that's where he tells you, if you made a vow to God in your desperate situation, you need to keep your vow to God. Because when your car is going down and you're trying to get out of the seatbelt and the water's coming in, you're thinking to yourself, man, God, if you get me out of this, I will teach, I will teach in the children's department for Tammy for 80 years. <laughs> right? I'm trying to help Tammy. She needs volunteers. Anyway, back to my sermon. So uh, what do you do? So point number one, tell God about your trouble. That's verses th- one to three, five to nine. Tell God about your trouble. Remember the old song, the old gospel song, have a little talk with Jesus? Remember that song? Were you not raised listening to gospel music? Okay, we're going to talk about that song later. But you just need to have a little talk with Jesus. And he tells Jesus, I need some things from you, God. And let me tell you about my situation in detail. Uh, because God does listen to you in, when you're in Goth. So notice what he says. Be merciful to me, O God. Why? Well, for man would swallow me up, and he's fighting all day to oppress me. He lives for that. So he says, God, I need from you mercy while I'm living in this environment. So let's just pretend that Washington, D.C., this whole environment, is your goth. Like, who would think of moving here? You laugh, why? I came here because of the weather. No. I came here because there's no congestion. No. I came here for a sole pace of life. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, uh, et cetera. We could go down the list, right? But you're here, right? And now you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when my dad... His friend took a job with Nixon back in 72, and my dad, you know, was, worked for this uh, guy at the port of entry. Uh, my dad then came back here, drove us back here, five days in the car to see his friend, to scope out D.C., to see whether he wanted to move here, to move up in rank. We came in like July from California. And we told my dad, when we got in the car after seeing his friend J.D. and his wife, Oweda, we, we told my dad, Dad, never moved there. Isn't God kind of humorous? What do you do to me? (laughs) Unbelievable. Be merciful to me to God because I live in God. You sovereignly brought me. Remember, when you have a blowout and your car hurdles into the water and you can't believe what happened to you, you're thinking to yourself, this must have got by the providence of God. No, it didn't. God, God knows exactly what happened. You are where you need to be for good reason. So you pray for mercy. Why? Well, my enemies want to swallow me up. And it's, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. He says, be merciful to me, oh God. He didn't say, oh Lord capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. He didn't say uh, Adonai, capital L, small O-R-D. He said, no, God. Why do you use that name? Because that's the name Elohim. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens, the Hashemayim, and the earth, the Ha'eretz. He created these things. And so he uses the name of God Almighty as the creator. Why? All throughout this passage, it's like a cord woven through the passage because he's telling God, if you can create ex nihilo out of nothing, then handling my situation in God, no problemo, right? Or is it problema? I don't know. What is it? Thank you. Muy bien. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so he says, it's not a problem because God, you, you, you are with me. So my, the world wants to swallow me up. The, the, world, the word here uh, uh, is, is most interesting. They want to swallow him up. It really is the Hebrew for like a hyena hunting a gazelle. The hyena is running after the gazelle because the hyena is fast. And the hyena is going to eventually get that gazelle because the gazelle is going to eventually go, man, I am tired. I dodge left, it dodges left. I dodge right, it dodge right. And it eventually gives up and bam, it's lunchtime. So this is what they do. The godless don't want to hear what you have to say about morals, about spirituality, about the true living God. They don't want to hear it. So anymore, it's rhetoric, no reason, and they'll do everything they can to shut you down. He he said, they want to to hunt me. That's what they do. He said, they fight me. He said, they're fighting all day long. Now, fighting is a participle. We at our church love grammar. It's so important, right? Okay, thank you for proving me. So It is a participle, which means they do this as a lifestyle. It's what they live for. Are there people that are that evil? Answer, yes. They cannot handle a godly moral voice. They cannot. And so he says, they they try to fight me. And the word here in Hebrew, uh, uh, the word is lakam. It means to fight in close quarters. So this isn't a fighting at a distance. This is, he's in my face, hand-to-hand combat. Ever had that happen? Been there, done that. See, they, they, uh, they try to oppress you is what they do. So the, the person who's saying you are the oppressor, they're the oppressor, oppressing you. 
And they're using inversion to make you think that you're the oppressor when you're not. It's really them. Uh, my grandchildren live here now, so I've been, having, I've been learning how to, well, child-proof my house. They're really sneaky, aren't they? They, they get stuff and into stuff. That it's like I, I never even thought of putting that away. Um, so, you know, I, I, think I, I think I got pretty much everything squared away. There's a few things I don't know where they've gone, but I'm sure in God's good timing I'll find them one day. But when you think about the word oppression, uh, to me, it, it, that whole Hebrew word came to play this week when I was playing with my uh, grandkids, and they had Plato. Plato. Pla- Plato is a theological, etymological, lexical exercise. How so? Because the word oppression means to squeeze something into another shape. Oh. So I'm sitting there, I translated this Hebrew word earlier in the week, and then I'm playing with my kids, and I'm like, I have this aha moment. Plato! Squeezing! And so what are they trying to do? Well, my grandkids, they told me, Papa, could you take the, the blue Play-Doh, put it in your hand, and just squeeze it as hard as you can? So I have a really good grip. And so I stuck it in my hand, and I squeezed it super tight, uh, and it just shot out of all my knuckles, and it was, just, it was just a mess. It was everywhere. It was really quite cool. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, this is what David's talking about. The godless world in Goth doesn't want, here, want, doesn't want the Christian there because you bother their immoral situation, their false worldviews. You don't, you, you don't support their presuppositions that are faulty, etc. So what do they do? They try to squeeze you into their mold. That's oppression. How do they do that? Well, they stig- stigmatize your belief in God. <laughs> You're a Christian? Really? Why? There's no proof for that. I mean, who would ever believe any of that stuff? Um, they will drive you from the public scene because, well, you're problematic. And you say things that are problematic, according to them. Uh, they will hur- hurl pejorative terms at you. Why? Well, because they can't handle the argument, so they just slap, well, nasty words on you. I've, I've experienced all of these things. But it's all in a quest to squeeze you into their mold, to evidence their mantra, and to oppress you so you'll be quiet. David says, boy, that's what happened to me in Goth. They did it to me all the time. Verse 2, he says, it, my enemies hound me all day. For there are many who fight against me, O Most High. He said, Lord, they run in packs. Why? There's more power in a pack. And he said, it's just me against all of them. And he says, they, they hound me all day long. Um, and they, they, for there are many, he says, who fight against me. Does evidence matter to them? No. Uh, do facts matter to them? No. Can you logically reason with them? No, no. They're Philist- Philistines. You, you're not going to reason with them. You know, think of, think of our Lord. Uh, uh, he faced individuals like this that David's talking about. So you have David, who is, represents Jesus to come, the greater David. So when the greater David gets here, the Messiah, he faces people like this that really uh, attacked him all day long to shut Jesus down. Um, after he raises Lazarus from the dead in, in John chapter 11, read the conversation with the religious leaders of the day. The very people who should have embraced Christ attacked him because he blew away their system. Notice what we read, verse 47 of John 11. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered to get counsel, and they said, what shall we do now that he's raised Lazarus from the dead? For this man works many signs. So instead of saying, hey, if the guy can raise someone from the dead, he must be God. No. What are we going to do? Notice verse 48. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Translated, we're going to lose our power over the people. We can't let that happen because of this one guy, and we don't care what he does. We need to take him out, Jesus. Verse 49, and one of them, this very crafty Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you, 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 know, you guys know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. So you guys have a clue. He's going to prophesy. We need to take out one Jewish guy, Jesus, even though he's done great things for the nation, healed many, taught wonderfully, raised the dead, etc. But we need to take him out or we lose our power. Sick, isn't it? He says, now this is, he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Remember, facts don't matter. I mean, you would think to yourself, I mean, you know, if I wasn't a Christian and, and I said something like, you know, if I could just see somebody rise from the dead, I would totally believe in Jesus. What's the answer to that? And you probably wouldn't. Because when these religious men who knew the Messiah was going to come do great signs saw them with their own eyes, they were more worried about their power and their position than they were truth. 
And so what did they do? They plotted to take him out, and they did. Very interesting. David says, been down that road. He says, they, they're, they're after me all day long, and they fight against me, Lord. That's exactly what they did to Jesus. He says, many are who fight against me. Then he throws in the clause at the end of verse 2. He, he says, O most high. Uh, that is not a good translation in my estimation. Uh, in, the, in the Hebrew text, li uh, maron uh, is the word. It's a prepositional phrase followed by maron, the word to be high or lifted up. Uh, so it doesn't tell you that it's God himself. So I think the better translation is the ones I've given to here, like King James. For there are many who fight against me with reference to their lofty social position. That's, that's more of an appropriate translation to me. That's kind of my translation. Uh, NIV says, my adversaries pursue me all day long in their pride. Many are attacking me. They're taking their prideful, lofty social position of power, whatever it is, your boss, a CEO, a colonel, whatever it is, and they use that position to exploit their, you, to silence you. David says, I've seen them do that to me constantly, constantly. What do you do when you're in that kind of situation? That's what D David's telling us to do. Notice what he says that we need to do in verse three. He says, whenever I'm in that kind of situation, I freak out and freeze up. What does he say he does? He, he, I'm like the lady in the car, God. I trust in you that I'm in the water for a good reason, and I'm gonna trust in you and do what I need to do to get out of this situation. I know, I know I'm gonna do the right things. He said, I'm gonna trust you. So, do you really trust God in Gath that where you are right now? You had a blowout. You've been thrown into the river. The car's sinking. It seems like the nation's sinking with you. Like what? And God's like, you're going to trust me? Because if you really trust God, you will talk to God. And you will tell him the specifics of what you're up against because he listens to you and he will act. Verse 5, he says, all day long they twist my words. All their thoughts are evil, only evil against me. They take what I say and they turn it to something else I didn't say, and then they beat me with that. Have you ever had that happen to you? No, I, I, I didn't say that. So if you, I'll give you an illustration. So you say you're, and I am, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life, right? So you say you're pro-life, and then they say what? Well, you must, you must hate women. No, I love life, <laughs> and I love the life of the mother, and I love the life of the child whose DNA structure is different than the mother's. It's a whole separate person. No, but you must be a hateful person. No, no, I'm not a hateful person. I mean, do you see what I mean? So it's, it, I didn't say that. So it's another sermon series. I, I don't have time to talk about it because I only have 30 minutes. Oh, we don't have a service after this. <laughs> <laughs> they twist your words. So what should you do? As a side note, untwist your words. I never said that. I never intimated that. I never, I never meant that. This is what I meant. Be clear and do it nicely. Uh, that's what, that's what uh, the Lord did. That's what David did. So they twisted his words. They used it for evil. And David says, you know, I've been there, done that. You know the drill. Verse 6. He said, they also gathered together. They hide. They mark my steps. They lie in wait for my life. I mean, they got a drone over me. They're following my iPhone. I'm adding to the text. I mean, I can't get away from these people. I mean, there's some kind of tracking device on me. Where am I at? Well, who, who, do you, who is he with today? Who is he talking to? Okay, we need to take him out. We need to take out everybody that he was talking to. He's, he's infected all of You see what I mean? He said, what is up with these people? They can't handle me in their culture. Now, Jesus ran into people like this. Uh, again, uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Uh, and I, I, Luke chapter 5 will introduce you to their tactics again in Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 5, interesting passage. Again, if you think the Bible's boring, read Luke 5. Jesus is teaching in a house. The houses back then had flat roofs, still do today. Um, they had a, a parapet wall around the top. Uh, and they had a side staircase to come up at night in the cool of the evening to catch some air. And so Jesus is inside the house teaching, and some friends who have a friend that can't walk put him on a stretcher and tie some ropes to the four corners, and they haul him up the side of the house, and they go to where they think Jesus might be in kind of like Mission Impossible style. You know what I'm talking about? They, you cut a hole in the roof, and they lower the body of their friend. Can you imagine what Jesus is teaching, all the debris falling on him? What in the world? Rocks, you know, tile, straw, boom, boom, boom. Um, total distraction. And all of a sudden, here, they start lowering him down. And there the guy is swinging in front of Jesus. Now keep that in mind, this is Luke 5. Now it happened on that day, in verse 17, on a certain day, as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, okay? Why are they there? Uh, not for good reason. Uh, who, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Oh, the big dogs are there, the big rabbis from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them, okay? 
So the guy's swinging there in front of Jesus. Jesus stops his teaching, and in verse 20, he says, when he saw their faith, the faith of this man's friends, he said to the man on the stretcher who can't walk, what's he tell him? You see, it's in English. You see it? Man, your sins are forgiven you. Do you realize how interesting it is that he said that? Because he, he makes a statement, and when he makes that statement, he just went on the offensive, not in an offensive way, he just went on the offensive with the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because they know that only God can heal, and they know that only God can forgive sins. So he goes on the offensive. Instead of just healing the guy outright, he says, no, before I heal this guy, let me first forgive all of his sins. They freak out. Because remember, they're there hunting him. It says in verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive God, uh, sins but God alone? Who does Jesus think he is? He's from Nazareth. I mean, his dad was a carpenter. I mean, he's a, we, we know who this kid is. He says he's forgiving sins. Blasphemer. Uh, verse 22, you would never want to debate Jesus because he could read your thoughts. Could you imagine that in a debate? Totally awesome. It says in verse 22, Jesus perceived their thoughts and he answers and he said to them, he's answering their thoughts. Um, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, you, or to rise up and walk. He said, let me ask you a question. Which is easier? I'll ask you, which is easier to say? Guy's swinging in front of you, he can't walk, he's paralyzed. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk out of here. Which is easier? Your sins are forgiven. Because can you see it when it's done? Well, not really. It's harder to say, rise up and walk, because the guy's got to actually get off the bed. So Jesus first says, let me forgive your sins, and then he turns and he, he tells the guy to get up and walk. He says in verse 24, but that you may know the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and, and go out of the house. Verse 25 says, immediately he rose up from before them, took, and everybody would have known this guy. Uh, he rose up before him, took it, what he'd been lying on, and he departed out of the house glorifying God. I mean, we, do we know the guy's name? No, so let's just call him Yehuda. Sounds like a good Jewish name, doesn't it? Let's just say, you know this guy. He's been paralyzed all your life when you went to school with him, etc. He's never been able to walk. And all of a sudden, this guy says, I forgive your sins, now get off the bed and walk. Not only does he get up off the, the pallet and walk, he picks it up and walks out with it. Don't you think that's kind of amusing and powerful? Who was Jesus? What'd the facts say? Well, the facts said that he was God so that he could forgive sins. Did that change their mind about Jesus? No, remember, they were hunting Jesus because they couldn't stand what he stood for. He threatened their power base as, as religious politicians. They couldn't have that, so they had to take him out at all costs, even though the presupp presuppositions were, were wrong, i.e., he's, he's not God. No amount of evidence changed their mind. David said, I face those kind of people. Jesus fa faced those kind of people. You will face those kind of people. Maybe you're facing them now. You're in Goth. Well, what do you do? You have a little talk with Jesus and tell him, God, this is what I'm facing. Number two, we have two quick points. Second thing you should do is turn and feed on the word of God. Turn and feed on the word of God. Translated, you should at that point when you're in Goth, read the Bible like you've never read it before. Uh, I talked to a man associated with our church uh, who's you know, part of just the political strife that's going on here. And he's frustrated. And, uh, and he wanted to know like, how to think about this as a Christian man. And I told him, point two, turn to the word of God. Like never before, double down on it, read it. And I said, in your situation, if I was you, I would read Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah was the prophet of God when the, when the Babylonians were gonna destroy his nation as they were disintegrating as a nation and study his life. Read the book and ask yourself one question. How did a godly man respond to his culture as it disintegrated? And then you go do likewise. And so that's your quest. Turn to the word of God. Notice what he says. Verse four, I, in God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. Verse 10 and 11, in God I will praise his word. Uh, in the Lord I will praise his word. In God I will put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Imagine. He says, they're gonna try to crush me in Goth, silence a godly man, 
but I will turn in that situation and have a talk with God and tell him what I'm facing with specificity. This is what they're doing to me because God hears me. And number two, I will get into the word of God like never before. I will read the word of God. That's what you need to do. Because what do you find when you read the word of God? Well, you find little stories, either that you forgot about or God reminds you of. Because you find like when, when, when they threw the, the, the Jewish boys into the fiery furnace, the God of fire said, not a problem. <laughs> no, I'll deliver them. When they threw uh, Daniel into the den with the lions, the lion from the tribe of Judah looks down from the throne and says, got this. I'm the lion. I control the lions. See, when you read the word of God, you find out that God specializes uh, in dealing with his people who have blowouts to help them. That's what, he, that's what you learn. What does Jesus say? Well, don't fear them. No, twice he says here, what can flesh do to me? What can, fle what can flesh do to you? Well, they can take you off Twitter. They can cancel your Facebook account. Uh, they can cancel your job. They can make it difficult for you to get a job. Uh, they can force you into early retirement. Uh, they can cancel your life insurance policy. And on and on and on goes what the culture does. Should you be afraid? No. Because what does David say twice? What shall flesh do to me? Because they can't touch your spiritual man. Do you know that? They're just attacking the temporal stuff. What does Jesus say about the temporal stuff and the eternal stuff? Matthew 10, 28. Notice what Jesus says. Do not fear those who kill the body, but it cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to what? Destroy both body and soul in hell for eternity from what he knows, what he teaches elsewhere. He says uh, you should really fear God Almighty because you have to give account to him one day. So if, if you're a person that's a Philistine and you live for the things we've been talking about, hopefully God's talking directly to you today and saying that's kind of a no-win situation because you're not going to win. My, my people will win because I'm with them. Truth will win. What should you do in the meantime? Last thing, uh, take time to fulfill your word to God. So take time for his word. Take time to fulfill your word. Notice verse 12. Vows made to you are binding up on me, O God, Elohim, creator God. I will render praises to you. Make your vow to God. Fulfill it. Then he goes on to say, I'm going to pray like you've already delivered me. But in the meantime, he says, I am going to realize the vow I made to you while I was in Goth. I'm going to fulfill that vow. So what did you tell Tammy? You didn't really tell her anything. Uh, I, 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 you could totally count on me for the next, until Jesus calls me home, I will serve in the children's department or I will work as a, as a leader at a youth table or I will be a door greeter or I will be there for the men's ministry. I will help him cook breakfast. I will help him clean up. I mean, God, you can count on me. So when God does deliver you from Goth, God's looking down from heaven going, okay. Oh, okay, what's he waiting for? Well, for you to step up and go, God, I made a vow to you. I'm gonna fulfill the vow. Yeah, it, you should make a vow to God to say, God, uh, Here's my vow, because when God does deliver you, then you can praise him for delivering you. What should you be doing this afternoon? Well, I give me give you some advice uh, as, as we live in Goth as people in tough times. Uh, you should have a little talk with Jesus. I mean, sit down and tell him your troubles, because he listens to you. David says here in the Psalms, uh, God, take my tears and put them in a bottle. Why? Well, it's not really a bottle in Hebrew. It's more like a wineskin. He says, God, I've cried a lot. You know my wonderings. You, you know my tears. All the things I faced in my political life, public life, whatever. Carry, you got all my tears. So that when judgment day comes, judgment will be rendered in light of what's been done. So tell God your troubles and have a talk with him. I don't know how you were raised. I was raised on old gospel music. Uh, here's a case in point of what you need to do when you head home today. What do you, <laughs> what do you need to do? If you walk out of here and think, I have no idea what that guy was talking about. Mm -mm, don't email me. I told you. You need to, you, you hit the water, car's going down to the abyss of Gath, and you're thinking, why in the world does this happen to me? You need to have a little talk with God. And he's going to hear you. He's going to hear you, and, he, and, he, and he's going to act. You know that, uh, that, that bass singer up there? That was how deep my dad's voice was when he was alive. It was scary. Because whenever he would talk, it's like, yes, sir. You know, it's like, God must have a voice like that. I used to tell my dad, why didn't God give me your voice for preaching? <laughs> Deep face. I mean, yeah. oh, I don't know. God's interesting, isn't he? Yeah. This is what my parents raised us on. I got the picture from when I was a kid. That when I have troubles, well, I, I go to Jesus. And you know what? I do. And he's always there for me. He's going to be there for you. Even this week. Let's pray. God, thank you. 
that we can have a little talk with you and we can tell you our troubles in great detail. And not that you just look at them and yawn and move on to the next person, but you focus on them, you collect our tears, uh, you know compassionately what we're facing, and you as a good father look down at our lives and realize what you need to do to bring deliverance, hope, and grace to us in due time. May we hang on to see you do great things. And thank you that you're a great God in Christ's name. Amen. And have a great afternoon. God bless you.